morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock here in the UK. You're very welcome to spend your breakfast with us here at Sky News this morning. He's calling it a cruel lottery, and today MPs will vote on the Prime Minister's plans to hike taxes to help fix the social care crisis. We'll ask the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, how breaking promises to the public sits with him. We'll also ask him about a warning from the AstraZeneca boss that booster jabs may not be needed for everybody. It was like a new snowfall, this muffled sound of silence. And for a few seconds, we wondered if we were still alive. Remembering 9-11, we speak to the first fire chief on the scene of the attack at the World Trade Center ahead of the 20th anniversary. In addition, keeping it quiet, we speak to the former Welsh rugby player Gareth Thomas about why many men don't want to share their health concerns on National Suicide Prevention Month. It's Wednesday, the 8th of September. Ending the cruel lottery of who can meet care costs without facing ruin, the Prime Minister defends his tax hike to fix the social care crisis as MPs prepare to vote on it. I'm live in Downing Street as Boris Johnson takes a big political gamble. Will MPs back his tax hike to support the NHS and social care? And I'm live off the coast of Calais as the Home Secretary warns she might withhold funding if French authorities don't do more to intercept migrants in these waters. And I'm here in Manchester as a new report reveals that people in the north of England were more likely to die from Covid and spent longer in lockdown. Freeing Britney. The superstar's father files a legal petition to end the conservatorship that's controlled her personal life and finances for the last 13 years. The consequences of terror survivors of the Bataclan attack prepared to testify in France's biggest ever trial where they're live. Although the heat and the sunshine continues for many today, the weather will turn cooler and more unsettled over the next few days. Morning, the Prime Minister has defended his plans to fix the social care crisis with a tax hike by saying the government needs to end the cruel lottery of who or who will not face financial ruin to meet their care costs. In just a couple of minutes' time, we'll be joined by the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid. Also today, ahead of the September 11, 20th anniversary this weekend, we've spoken to the first fire chief on the scene of the World Trade Centre attacks, Joseph Pfeiffer. He's revealed how things unfolded that day. Somebody yelled, the building is collapsing, and we started to run. However, with helmet and bunker coat, pants and, and boots, you don't run too far or too fast in 11 seconds. And then this beautiful summer morning, full of sunshine, goes completely black, where we couldn't see a thing. And then the, all that noise from the crashing steel and concrete goes silent. It was like a new snowfall, this muffled sound of silence. And for a few seconds, we wondered if we were still alive. And you can watch my full interview with Joseph Pfeiffer today at half past seven on the programme. Uh, heading to New York uh, tomorrow to bring you extensive coverage here on Sky News. 20th anniversary of 9-11 this Saturday. Health Secretary Sajid Javid is with us. Do you remember where you were when it happened? Yes, I do. I'll, I'll never forget. I was working on the trading floor in the city. And uh, what I, one thing I won't forget is that we had a, a live sort of phone connection at all times with our trading floor in the World Trade Center and we could hear the sounds and the, and the noises coming live uh, down the line, and you know, I'd never forget that. No one could. Did all your colleagues get out? Yes, they did. Thank Well, uh, almost all of them, sadly. Some did not. Mm. Uh, 20th anniversary, can't believe it, really, can we? Um, I want to talk to you about um, health and social care in just a second, but given that we're talking about that, I, I, can I ask you about Afghanistan? The Taliban's appointed a caretaker government. One of the people, the interior minister, is on the FBI's most wanted. Are they people that we can do business with? 
Well, I, I would say in the last 24 hours, I haven't had much time to look at the Afghanistan caretaker government. Uh, but I think that as a general uh, point, that now the Afghanistan clearly seem to be in charge, uh, that we need to keep under review how we work with them. But it's also going to be in our long-term interest to make sure that we can continue to help people in Afghanistan, especially those people that we have commitments to that are still trying to leave. We can work with a terrorist government, though, can we? No, I'm, I'm not saying we should recognise the government. The Prime Minister has been very clear about this, that if we eventually formally recognise a government, then there's certain uh, things that we will be looking for, uh, not just in behaviour, but how they also uh, deal with uh, other governments as well and, and some of the plans that they make. But what we should always be doing is looking to find ways to help those people that still need our support in Afghanistan. Mm. Something that you're very comfortable talking about, of course, this morning is health and social care. Um, I read in the papers it's the highest taxes since the Second World War. Um, are you sure you're in the right party? <laughs> yes, I, I'm sure of that. I think what we've announced in the last 24 hours actually is a, is a very conservative uh, thing to do. We are committed as a party to the NHS. Uh, I want the NHS to be there for everyone, a world-class health service, free at the point of use, paid through general taxation. I, as a health secretary, when I came into this job a couple of months ago, and I was told that the waiting list, already at 5.5 million, because of the global pandemic and the pressures that's created, could go to as high as 13 million in three years' time. I can't tolerate that. I can't accept that. So something had to be done, and I think the British public understand that. Similarly, with adult social care, I think the fact that some people uh, have this risk of catastrophic cares uh, cost, your care of cost, mm. that, that, that is not acceptable, where you have some one in seven people that have to pay over £100,000 for their care. And I think it's a very conservative thing to do, to give people that confidence, uh, that to know that their lifetime cost of care can be capped for them. And the plan is to cap that at £86,000, I think is the right thing to do. And to do it properly and sustainably, I don't like raising taxes. I want taxes to be as low as they possibly can be. But I think people understand, if we want the NHS to be there for us always, doing its job, then uh, uh, we've got to properly fund that. And the same applies to adult social care. Is this going to be enough money or will we be potentially looking at more tax rises? No, I think this is enough money. I mean, this is a this is a very large amount of money. It's about twelve billion pounds a year. So, over the three year uh, next three years, thirty six billion pounds. Uh, it's around sixteen billion of that directly to the NHS. That will pay for things like nine million more checks, scans, and, and treatments, helping to tackle uh, that waiting list. It's also over five billion pounds more uh, for the adult social care system. Not just paying for that that cap, but also a more generous means-tested system, more support for the workforce. These are exactly the kind of changes we need to make. But only one in, uh, only a pound in every six is going to go to social care and that in a couple of years' time. Almost all of it is going to go to the NHS. Um, can you guarantee that the money will go to social care in the, in the fullness of time? Yes, the money that we've planned... Because Damien so. Green, who you know, a uh, former Cabinet Office Minister, saying... The 5.4 5 billion will go to social care. That's, uh, that, that's, yeah, that's clearly set out uh, in our plans. And, in fact, we're already that's working... Yeah, that, that's Yes, it will go. That, OK, that, because that's, you, you that's made lots planned. of promises in your manifesto and you've broken those. Well, I'm very happy to talk about that. And the Prime Minister has been very clear on that when questioned yesterday. So he was asked, for example, around the promise not to raise uh, national insurance and, and other uh, tax rates. And, and you know what we could have done? The options were we could have just doggedly stuck to that and said, you know, we know there's been a global pandemic. We know that the NHS and social care are facing their biggest challenges in their lifetime. But you know what? We've got a promise on, on, on taxes and we're not going to touch them. And therefore, people will just have to live with this risk. And, and that's not, that's not the, what a responsible government would do. Yeah, the job of a responsible government morning, is to be look, honest be and to deal with the to challenges. You. Yeah, my, my viewers this morning will say, yeah, but you've broken two election promises within two years. And I think your viewers will also see, uh, through their own uh, regions, the areas that they live, the pressures that are on the NHS, they can see the rise in the waiting list has already taken place to 5.5 million. And just imagine if it was going to go to 13 million, if, if it had been business as usual, that's, what was, that's what's likely to have happened, a 13 million waiting list. That could have been one person in every family on the waiting list. I'm the health secretary, health and social care secretary. I can't have that. And I don't think your viewers want that. And so 
it has to be paid for. When you are going to pay for that, you can't then just say, we're going to borrow it, as some people suggested yesterday. Why don't you just borrow it? Because that's just really putting off the problem and moving it to the next generation. It's just a future tax rise for our young people today. We've got to confront it, and that means everyone paying into it together. And I think the way the Chancellor has come up with the money, which is mainly through this increase in, in national insurance, the health and social care levy, and ring-fenced it and guaranteed that it will always in the future go to health and social care, I think that's the right way to do it, and it's a very progressive way to do it. Are you saying that the NHS wasn't in trouble before COVID? No, the NHS, of course, it's always, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's it's been the biggest, it, no, it's the biggest universal health service in the world. It's always had uh, challenges for as long as I can remember. But I think the difference now is that with the global pandemic and what that's unleashed, it's the biggest challenge in, its, in, in living memory. I think it's fair to say that. And I'm full of nothing but praise for everyone that works in the NHS and how they have handled uh, this pandemic. And they also deserve this support, making sure that they've got the equipment that they need, the PPE they need, the new technology that they need, and that we continue to invest. So, for example, one of the things I'll be doing with this money mm -hmm. is creating a lot more of what I call surgical hubs. Because if I look at that waiting list, uh, a lot of the waiting is for treatments like, uh, it might be like a hip replacement, a, a cataract surgery. And if I, we can create more of these dedicated hubs, we can offer more of these treatments, you know, come rain or shine, every day they're available, while the NHS gets on with uh, other work as well. So are you saying, are you saying that this money will guarantee to clear the backlog? No, no responsible health secretary can make that kind of guarantee. So how what do you I know can, it's enough money? You what started I can, off by saying it was enough money. Because how we've, do you know? Because we've worked with the NHS uh, very closely, as you would imagine, and we have thought carefully about the money that's needed, but we've also had to make some assumptions and, and you know, on things that no one can tell you what, what's actually going to happen. So with COVID, the pathway of COVID, no one in the world knows what happens next with COVID. So I have to make assumptions about, for example, how much testing we need to do, how much uh, we will spend on vaccines and on PPE. We've also had to uh, make uh, assumptions about the, the, uh, the amount of um, the, you, the capacity in the NHS and how, how we can increase that. So what we've worked out with the NHS, for example, is that the NHS will be able to operate at 110% of uh, its normal capacity a year. So it can get through a lot more uh, treatments and checks and scans uh, than before. So I'm going to be working hand in hand really closely with the new chief executive of the NHS and making sure that together we're doing everything we can. What I can be absolutely certain of is that this will massively reduce the waiting list from where it would otherwise have been. It will hugely tackle it, and that's what I think your viewers would expect me to do. Uh, vaccinations, let's talk about that, given that we're talking sure. about uh, COVID. Where are we with the booster jabs? Because it depends who you're talking to as to whether or not they're a good idea. We've received interim advice on boosters, and that was a few weeks ago and I published it. And that was clear that there should be some kind of uh, booster programme. So I'm, I'm very confident there will be a booster programme. For who? But in terms, well, the, in terms of who actually gets it and when, we're waiting for final advice, which could come across certainly in the next few days from the JCVI. And I need to see that advice because they rightly are looking at studies that they've done uh, to look at what should be, you know, should, should we be mixing vaccines, for example, or should people get the same vaccine? They're also looking at whether it makes sense to co-administer it for everyone with a flu jab as well. So that work is almost done. And uh, based on the, 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 the time timeline that they've given us, I, I'm confident that we can start the booster programme uh, this month. You don't always take the advice of the JCVI, though, do you? Um, I have done, yes, okay, and, and so including... To 15 yes, I thought you were going to say that, yeah, and I've taken their advice, <laughs> because what was their advice? Their advice was that they've looked at this, and they are only, by statute, able to look at the, the health side of vaccination. They're not able to look at wider issues when it comes to children, such as the impact on their education, schooling and things like that. And they've said that they recommended to me, their advice was that you should ask the, the chief medical officers of the UK collectively for their opinion, because they don't feel qualified to talk about issues that are not in their mandate. I've taken their advice. OK, so are 12 to 15 year olds going to have jabs? Don't know. I haven't got the advice from the, okay, the, from the chief it? medical officers. Um, I, I would expect, I, 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 did, I couldn't put a timeline on them. I think that would have been unfair because they've got to come to their own judgment um, independently. They've had, the kids they've, have gone back to school. Well, the chief medical officers have had about four days 
so far. Jesse VI, of and, course, as we both yeah. know, have had significantly longer than that. You would have thought yeah. that you'd be able to dovetail that back into kids going back to school. Well, the chief medical officers is, is who I'm waiting for uh, now, and uh, I want to give them the breathing space. It's their independent view, and uh, and that's exactly what it should be. But I, 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 I would expect to hit from them in the next few days. How would you feel about 12 to 15 year olds uh, of yours having jabs? I don't think it's appropriate for me to pass a judgment because I'm waiting for an independent view. Do you think that 12 to 15 year olds should be able to overrule their parents on whether or not they should have jobs? I think we should follow the same rules that we've had in this country under successive governments for, for decades, which is that uh, it, you first would try to seek the consent uh, of parents. So parents, we're, we're going to ask all parents for consent. And uh, in most cases, but That's what if they don't give it, is my question. If they don't give uh, consent... And children still want their vaccination. Exactly. So if there's a difference so of opinion between mm -hmm. the child uh, and the parent, mm -hmm. uh, then we have uh, specialists that, let's say, that work in this area, the school's vaccination service. They would usually literally sit down with the parent and the child and try to reach some kind of consensus. If ultimately that doesn't work, mm -hmm. uh, as long as uh, we believe that the child is competent enough to make this decision, then the child's will will prevail. How do you feel about an October firebreak, if necessary? Would you support it? Um, what do you mean by that? I mean by, uh, by that potentially, well, firebreak, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, in order to, in, in some form or another, in order to try to stop the virus um, getting legs again going into the winter. Well, I don't think that, uh, that's something we need to consider. I didn't think that last year. Look, look it, it is true that no one knows the future pathway of this, uh, of this virus. I'm guessing you'd support it. So, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't even thought about that as a as an option at this point because I That's think the decisions worrying. well no as the decisions that we've made in the last uh, few weeks and certainly in the time I've been health secretary I think they've turned out to be the right decisions uh, we've shown that we the... were being told to eat out to help out this time last year well <laughs> I, was, I wasn't in government this time last year so you can get a minister in that that you know, was making whatever decision they make you want bad to talk decisions? about I can talk about the decisions that have been made since I've been in government, and Surely, especially especially around if health. If it means that it won't, we won't have another wave. You're going to support a firebreak, aren't you? Obviously. Well, I've, I've told you. I think that what we are, the policies that we followed uh, so far, they're based on the the best uh, information, the best evidence that we can get. We listen to our experts, uh, uh, of course, as anyone would expect. And so, when we made the recent decision to start opening up the country, to move the social uh, distancing restrictions, uh, for example, and other rules, that I think that's turned out to be exactly the right decision. And it's not risk free. When you make these decisions, none of them are risk free. No one knows exactly what's going. Nobody to wants to be in happen. your shoes. That's yeah. obviously. The, I mean, you're doing an incredible job given the challenges that you're facing, but nevertheless... Thank you very people, much. People, well, it's true, it's true. Praise I mean, from Kay Burley. Well, <laughs> wow, that's rare, isn't it? You, exactly, but you better yeah. bottle it because I don't think... I'm not sure how often it's going to come along. But uh, people at home will want to know whether, if, when it's October half-term, potentially it, that could be two weeks for kids as a result of uh, trying to stop um, another wave, third, fourth, fifth wave, whatever we're counting. Our, our, our best defence against the, another wave or you know, COVID ever taking off again is the vaccine wall of defence. That's been hugely successful. We've got 80% of adults now uh, that are double vaccinated. And uh, we, the, we continue to build on that programme. We've just talked about boosters, uh, for example, as well. Uh, last week, I also announced uh, you know, a third uh, dose for those that are immunosuppressed, because, again, we're always looking at the evidence to see what more we can do. Sure. The vaccines are working. Yes, there are still infections. Of course, there still are. That's true around the world. But you know, the number of people going into hospital, and certainly those dying, is mercifully low, and that's because of the vaccines. We're out of time, but we're just about to head to um, Calais to our reporter on the boat. Uh, Fifty-four million pounds is how much we want to give to the French. Are we getting value for money from them when it yeah. comes to? Well, uh, I, th I think I, I think it's look. It's uh, when I was Home Secretary, I was working with the French on the on the same issue, and uh, they, you know, they. In my experience, is that it's really good to cooperate. Look, this is a joint problem between the French uh, and the British. And, uh, and, and I think it makes absolute sense to, to work together, to share intelligence and see what you can do. OK, it's good to talk to you. I'll have to let you go. It's great to see yeah. you. Thanks Thank for joining you us on the Thank programme you. this morning. Go with us just a second. Um, Adam is joining us uh, live from a boat in Calais. Hello to you, Adam. A very good morning. You heard what the former Home Secretary, now Health Secretary, had to say. Uh, working closely with the French. Is it working? 
it's sort of working, but it's a massive mountain. And today, Priti Patel is going to be meeting uh, her counterparts from France, Gerald Darmanin, and saying that she's going to threaten to withhold £54 million uh, of funding that uh, the UK uh, is about to give to the French to support the programme to try and intercept migrants in these waters. These, uh, that's... Uh, Plage Blériot around there, Songat just around the corner. These are names synonymous with hundreds, thousands of migrants who over the years have tried to get from these waters uh, over to the United Kingdom. And in the four or five hours we've now spent in the waters, I think we've got a sense of why this is so difficult. When we were here, uh, when it was absolutely pitch black, you could just see it's almost impossible, frankly, Kate, to tell the difference between a the shapes that you see, is that a wave? Is it rubbish on the water? Is it a bird? Could it be uh, a boat? Very hard to see that. We only saw one patrol vessel going past uh, during that night. So if you timed your boat leaving well, then you could avoid detection. I have seen another patrol vessel uh, over there in the past sort of 10 or, or, or 15 minutes or so. So you're not seeing waves after waves of them. But this is a coastline that goes on for tens of miles. To patrol it constantly would be completely impossible. And the local MP here says that £54 million pounds just isn't enough effectively to even scratch the surface of preventing people from making this journey. The thing that has the biggest impact probably is the weather. On a day like today, blue skies, uh, calm weather. People are bound to try to make this journey. Pretty Patel wants the French to do more. The French reaction, frankly, is that they are doing just about as much as they can. OK, thank you, Adam. Thanks a lot. In other news, people living in parts of uh, northern England were more likely to die from COVID, spent more time in lockdown and took a larger financial hit during the first year. Joining me now is our correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury, who is standing by in Manchester for us, um, basically underlining what we heard from the mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, during the, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Yes, this is a real snapshot of how the pandemic impacted people in the north. And the research, as I say, it was uneven and disproportionate. So it's things like more deaths. I think only uh, North Yorkshire and Cumbria had a lower COVID mortality rate than the uh, national, average, uh, national average. There was uh, more mental health issues. Uh, there were 26% more deaths in care homes, for example, 19% greater rate of unemployment than the rest of the country. Uh, and also when it came to addressing the pandemic, uh, people in the north spent longer in lockdown, as you say, Kay. So uh, 41 days more uh, in lockdown uh, than the rest of the country. You'll remember that Liverpool was the first country to go into the top tier when the tier systems came around and Manchester, here where I am, one of the last to come out of it. But it wasn't all bad news. Some of it was positive when it came to the vaccine rollout in the first six months of the rollout. Uh, the vaccination rate in the north of the country was greater than the rest of the country. Um, but the researchers are saying that the reason why the impact has been so bad uh, for people here was because of uh, greater deprivation and poorer pre-pandemic health and they're calling this a wake-up call and saying there needs to be greater investment in the north. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Looking at the latest COVID figures for you, they're looking something like this. 37,489 new cases were reported. A further 209 people have sadly died. The first time the number has been above 200 since the 1st of March. It takes the total number who've died within 28 days of a positive test to 133,483. 22,700 first doses given yesterday. 80,000 people received their second dose. 43.5 million people now fully vaccinated. Still to come on the programme for you, quarter to eight, I'm going to be speaking to the surgeon who separated conjoined twins. 20 past eight, former UK ambassador to Afghanistan, Sir Nick Kay, will be with me to discuss the Taliban's interim cabinet and the wider implications of their takeover. Quarter to nine, we'll speak to the former Welsh rugby player, Gareth Thomas, about why many men are still reluctant to discuss their health concerns. 
time, though, for a look at this morning's other main stories here on Sky. The trial of the 2015 Paris attacks begin today, with 20 people expected to appear before the court, include a, including, I should say, Salah Abdelazlam, the only living suspect. Islamic extremists killed 130 people when they detonated multiple bombs and shot concert goers and those enjoying a meal out in the French capital. Today will mark France's biggest ever trial. US President Joe Biden has declared climate change everybody's crisis as he visited neighborhoods severely damaged by the remnants of Hurricane Ida and said it's time for America to get serious about the dangers or face even worse disaster. Climate change poses an existential mm -hmm. threat to our lives, to our economy, and the threat is here. It's not going to get any better. The question, can it get worse? We can stop it from getting worse. And so, folks, we've got to listen to the scientists and the economists and the national security experts. They all tell us this is code red. The nation and the world are in peril. And that's not hyperbole. Yeah. That is a fact. At least 17 patients have been killed after heavy rainfall caused flooding at a hospital in Mexico's central Hidalgo state. Patients at the public hospital in the northern Mexico town of Tula were evacuated from the area after torrential rains flooded the hospital. The hospital had been caring for 56 patients, about half of them suffering from COVID-19. Looking at the impact of climate change on the planet, this is our dashboard for you. 26% of our power at the moment is coming from nuclear. Second line, that's how much hotter it is now than when records first began in 1880, 1.23 degrees. Time left, uh, 11 years, four months. If that temperature gets to one and a half degrees, that's the point of no return, according to scientists. And the scary figure at the bottom, that is the CO2 emissions in millions of tonnes. And you can keep up with all the stories affected by the global climate on The Daily Climate Show right here, live on Sky News, every weekday, live, 6.30. So what's the weather going to look like today? Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Answer is, it's looking like a heat wave. Three days running above 28 degrees. It's continuing for many today. Changes are underway, though, with the weather set to turn cooler and more unsettled over the next few days. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Love these pictures. Seen them in the papers today. Wanted to share them with you. An Air Force sergeant supporting the Kabul evacuations shared a picture of the moment he took hold of a two-week-old baby over here who was dropped by her ex exhausted mum during an airlift out of Afghanistan. Obviously, a daddy put these on to protect the baby's ears. Mum was absolutely exhausted. So what happened? Sergeant Andy Livingston took care of the little one while mum had some sleep. These pictures uh, posted online, as I said, in most of the papers today. How amazing is that? After the break. It was like a new snowfall, this muffled sound of silence. And for a few seconds, we wondered if we were still alive. Remembering 9-11, we speak to the first fire chief on the scene at the World Trade Center attacks.
it's estimated that around 70% of our coastlines are experiencing increased erosion. We start with a steel structure that we put into the seafloor. We then pass a, a very small electrical current between what we call an anode and the, and the cathode, and the structure itself is the cathode. Hello everyone, uh, this week marks the 20th anniversary actually of the 9-11 attacks. To mark the occasion, we've spoken to the very first New York fire chief to arrive at the scene of the World Trade Center attacks. Chief Joseph Pfeiffer told me the harrowing story of how that momentous day unfolded. As you'll hear, it began with his fire battalion investigating a simple gas leak report. Be prepared, this is a harrowing encounter. We were at a, a odor of gas in the street, a, a routine emergency, um, nothing to get too excited about since we weren't getting any, uh, any indications that we did have a gas leak. And then all of a sudden we heard a loud noise of a plane coming overhead. And you never hear planes in Manhattan because of the tall buildings. And then I saw this plane flying at a very low altitude and, and an extremely fast speed that zoomed past us. And then I saw the plane aim and crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Every first responder, firefighters, police officers, EMTs and paramedics, every one of them saw the burning towers. And even though this, this is our job, they made a personal decision to go into danger because we all knew we were going to the most dangerous fire of our lives. 17 minutes after the first plane hit, we heard another loud noise of, of racing jet engines, almost like a fighter jet, it sounded like. Um, and this was the second plane that crashed into the South Tower. So now we have two 110 story buildings on fire and thousands of people in the greatest moment of need. The planes were deliberately chosen to be hijacked because they were due to fly to various airports in California. As a result, they had an awful lot of jet fuel on them. That's why the buildings burned so ferociously for such a, a long time. When the fire officers were coming down, I think you were engine 33, many, many other fire officers from all around the area coming down to try to help. When you were sending them into those buildings, did you have any concept of what was going to happen? The plan was to, since we had no elevators working, to send the firefighters up. And I told them to do two things. One, to evacuate the building. And then two, we'll regroup on the upper floors to rescue those that couldn't get out. Was that a scene of calmness or chaos? Can you, can you take us back and tell us what it was like? The lobby where we set up our command post for the North Tower, there was broken glass everywhere. There was cracked marble falling off the wall and the firefighters came in quietly. They didn't say a lot and that's unusual for firefighters. They, they like to talk. Um, but they came in quietly, except for the banging of some of the tools. Um, they had a, a grim look on their face because they knew they were going to the most hazardous fire of their lives. And th that morning, not only did we, we were concerned about the fires, but as the fires spread, we heard another noise My job was and that was people jumping. And, I knew and they landed on 
a canopy over the front of the the the, the uh, entrance to the lobby with a loud thud, and we knew that each thud was the end of a life. And then at one moment, I got so frustrated that I got on the PA system, and I told them, I told people, if at all possible, hang on, we're coming up for you. But I only could imagine what a decision that they had to make between burning or jumping. Your brother, Kevin, also a firefighter, he came to join you, didn't he, um, at the North Tower. Can you tell us what happened next? A little bit before nine o'clock, my brother, Kevin, uh, from Engine 33, he was a lieutenant in Engine 33, he reported oh. into me. And I can remember we looked at each other and we had a concerned look on, on, on his face. And we worried whether each of us was going to be okay. And he didn't say a word. We just had a moment of understanding that this was going to be a tough day. Did you at any stage there, uh, Chief, think, I don't want him to go into this tower. I want him to stay here with me. I treated him as I did my other brother and sister firefighters. Um, I worried about him. I worried about, about the other firefighters. And I gave my brother, as well as the, uh, the other fire officers that came in to go up, go up, evacuate, and then rescue those that were trapped. All the while, people were flooding down the stairwells, um, trying to get out. The elevators weren't working. The jet fuel had come down the elevator shafts. It was setting fire to floors left, right, and center. Did it become more and more chaotic in the lobbies? What was happening then, and what were the comms like? People came down, and they were very orderly. As firefighters were going up the narrow stairs, people were coming down. And the firefighters did some ordinary things. They said to the people coming down, don't stop. You can make it out of here. Keep going. And we know from people who survived those simple words made the difference. And, and perhaps that's the reason that I chose for my, my memoirs, the title of Ordinary Heroes. Because at this extraordinary time in history, our firefighters did ordinary things to make a difference between life and death. When they started to collapse, when the South Tower collapsed first, although that was the second one to be hit, and then the North Tower collapsed about half an hour after that, where were you and, and what did you do? At 9.59, we heard a loud rumbling sound. And if you, you were watching it on a newscast, you saw that that was the South Tower collapsing. I had no idea that, that a whole building was falling to the ground. I thought part of the ele elevator debris was coming down the elevator shaft or part of the plane fell off and was crashing through the windows in the lobby. But the lobby goes completely black where we couldn't see anything. And at that point, we knew we couldn't command any longer. And I got on my radio and I said, command to all units in Tower One, evacuate the building. And they started to come down, the, our firefighters. Then what happened? Then 29 minutes later, I made it out to the street, standing in front of the North Tower and we hear a rumbling sound again. And this time somebody yelled, the building is collapsing. And we started to run. However, with helmet and bunker coat, pants and, and boots, you don't run too far or too fast in 11 seconds. 
And then this beautiful summer morning, full of sunshine, goes completely black, where we couldn't see a thing. And then the, all that noise from the crashing steel and concrete goes silent. It was like a new snowfall, this muffled sound of silence. And for a few seconds, we wondered if we were still alive. And what would you like um, the people um, of the United Kingdom and indeed around the world, what would you like them to be thinking? I would like people to remember not just the collapse and the tragedy, but also this sense of unity that we felt. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... That we were in this together. Um, and, and I like them to take that, that, that feeling of, of, of unity and see if we could apply it to the, today's fragmented world. And then I like especially the young people as they look at it, maybe for the first time, that they think of they think of heroes, not as super superheroes of, but rather of ordinary heroes, of a person they can become someday to make a difference in other people's lives. My goodness me, I tell you, it was a tough watch, didn't I? He was the first fire chief on the scene, uh, 2001, September the 11th, 20 years ago since Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four commercial jets packed with passengers and flew them into three targeted buildings in New York and in Washington, one of them landing in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after those on board managed to wrestle the controls of the aeroplane from the terrorists that thought that that plane was either heading to the White House or to the Capitol building. Yesterday, the former US National Security Advisor John Bolton recounted his memories of what happened that day. I went to my office, which was on the southwest corner of the seventh floor of the State Department, and somebody ran in and said, the Pentagon's been hit. So I went to the window, I could see the smoke uh, and the flames from the Pentagon. Full coverage of the 9-11 attack 20 years on from 5 p.m. on Friday. Going to be in New York that evening and on Saturday, the day of the anniversary. Full coverage from 9 o'clock in the morning right through for the whole of the commemorations to 10.30 p.m. on Saturday evening. Uh, actually, I was chatting to the health secretary a short time ago. He was telling me uh, that he was a trader in the city at the time of 9-11 and not all of his colleagues made it out of the Twin Towers. They had an open line to their colleagues in the Twin Towers. Not all of them, he said, made it out. You can hear what he had to say about that online, if you would like to, or at my Twitter account, at Kayburthy. Also asked him uh, about the highest taxes since the Second World War in order to pay for health and social care. His views on that in just a second. But also asked him about boosters. Kids have just gone back to school. Should adults be looking to having boosters? Um, talked about that. And in addition to that, um, asked him about jabs for 12 to 15 year olds. And if parents said they didn't want their kids to have those jabs, could children of 12, as young as 12, Still go ahead and have one. I think we should follow the same rules that we've had in this country under successive governments for, for decades, which is that uh, it, you first would try to seek the consent uh, of parents. So parents, we're, go we're going to ask all parents for consent. And uh, in most cases... But what if they don't give it, is my question. If they don't give uh, consent... And children still want their vaccination. Exactly. So if there's a difference so of opinion between mm -hmm. the child uh, and the parent, mm -hmm. uh, then we have uh, specialists that, let's say, that work in this area, the school's vaccination service. They would usually literally sit down with the parent and the child and try to reach some kind of consensus. If ultimately that doesn't work, mm -hmm. uh, as long as uh, we believe that the child is competent enough to make this decision, then the child's will will prevail. 
Tamara's on Downing Street for us this morning. Hello to you, Tamara. I found that staggering that he was suggesting to us that 12 year the man who's in charge of the health of the nation says 12 year olds can overrule their parents. That was interesting. And also the length of uh, waiting lists that we might have here in the UK. That was interesting, Kay, on 12 to 15 year olds, because there's been some real mixed messages on this coming out of government. To tell you where we are on jabs for 12 to 15 year olds, they're happening in a number of other European countries and in the US. They are not happening here as yet, except for 12 to 15 year olds with an underlying serious health condition who are having it already. The government was advised by its advisers on vaccines that there was only a marginal benefit for giving it for 12 to 15 year olds because they're not at risk of seriously getting COVID. But we are expecting a ruling from the chief medical officers possibly as soon as this week because they don't judge it just on that narrow basis of whether they will get serious COVID but on loss of education, risk to the rest of society. So they will make a recommendation this week and if they recommend going ahead with it, that could start in schools very, very soon. Parents will be asked for consent, but this is, I think, the most first explicit confirmation from the health secretary that if... This is not expected to be widespread, but in the rare instances where a child and a parent differ and the child is competent to make that decision, they will prevail. So that will be news to a lot of parents this morning. Certainly will. Tamara, for now, thanks so much indeed. Tamara live in Downing Street for us today. Um, talking about parents and their children, Britney Spears' dad has filed a petition to end the 13-year legal conservatorship that gave him control over his daughter's life, career and also finances. So what does that mean? Joining us from Washington to discuss this is our US political commentator and journalist, Scotty Nell Hughes. Hi, Scotty. Thanks for joining us. So is he throwing in the towel or is he saying to a judge, you decide? Oh, no, he's definitely throwing in the towel. But realize this, Kay, the only reason why he's doing it is because he realized that the legal walls were starting to close in. I think Jamie Spears, Britney's father, realized years ago he didn't care about the PR battle. He cared about continuing to have control over his daughter's life. But over the last few months, the legal battles, which normally had been going in his favor, have been turned, turned the tide and gone into Britney's favor, saying that she could actually now go in July and pick her own attorney. And ever since she got this new, very aggressive attorney named Matthew Rosengard, who made it a point to see her wish that her father potentially could be sent to jail because of abuses that Britney felt like she had during her time as him being her conservator, uh, he has been very aggressive and said just because he's relinquishing does not mean that we're not going to continue to pursue legal justice for Brittany, considering everything that she's gone through the past 13 years at the hands of her father. Um, when will we know? Well, you're going to know in about, well, it's going to happen. It's going to be at the end of September is the actual court date. And you have to remember, Brittany Spears' estate right now is only worth, and I say only, about $60 million, which is incredibly low considering she is a woman who's produced basically a hit with every album since they, she first started on the stage in 1998 with Baby Hit Me One More Time. So there is a lot of question of where all the money has gone. Then you bring in the charges of abuse, including sexual abuse, as well as possible uh, extortion in various forms. And there's a lot of questions right now that does not put Jamie Lynn Spears in actually good favor with any judge who looked at this case. And finally, having honest and truth uh, being spoken about is not only welcomed by Britney's fans, but also about the other 1.3 million adults in America who are conserva under conservatorships themselves, $50 billion worth of assets. This has exposed a lot bigger of a problem, Kay, in America, considering what this entire program has been and put a lot, shed a light on something that's been kind of swept under the rug for decades. Just before I let you go, only a short uh, amount of time left, Scotty. What do we know about her mental health at the moment? I have seen some um, concerning pictures on social media. Well, obviously, there's a lot of concerning, concerning pictures, but it was also said that her father uh, drugged her all of these years. So who knows what the effects of those drugs might be? I think we're not going to know the truth about her until after this conservatorship is done and her attorney is able to get some unbiased medical help for Brittany to assess uh, where her mental health is after. Like I said, 13 years of abuse can take a toll. And I think it's going to take, obviously, some real people with unbiased opinions to get in there and, and actually assess her uh, without having to worry about possible ramifications from her father anymore. Scotty, good to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Kay. Now, the odds of it happening are more than one in a million. And when it does happen, the chances of survival are low. What are we talking about? Conjoined twins.
that are born um, at the head, the outlook very bleak, but a new charity called Gemini Untwined, which specialises in surgical separation, is giving parents of conjoined twins the chance to return home with two healthy children. Uh, let's speak now, should we, to the founder of that charity, the paediatric neurosurgeon Awazi Jilani. Hello to you. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. You've just separated uh, two little girls, I think, haven't you, that were joined at the head. Tell us what happened. Uh, yes, we did the surgery last week in Israel. Uh, the surgery went well. We're delighted to say the girls are doing really well at this early stage. How complicated was it? Um, I mean, all conjoint twin procedures are complicated, but on a spectrum of the ones we've done, uh, one of the lesser complicated ones. What are the risks involved? Um, with, with, with all these surgeries, there's always the risk of losing one or both children at the time of the surgery. Um, so that risk was there with this set as well. And the other risks of causing injury to the brain, the blood vessels, causing a stroke. Um, it's, it's a high stakes, uh, high stakes undertaking. Um, one thinks that it's very unusual to see this sort of situation. But, you know, you have set up a, a charity, so perhaps more common than people might think. Um, well, we, we believe that there's probably about a dozen or such uh, or so kids born globally every year. And whilst we're really fortunate here in the UK, we've managed to gather the world's largest experience with our team of five cases now. Most centres, most countries in the world would not have dealt with such a, such a scenario. So the whole idea is, you know, whilst it's well and good that we can do these surgeries, it doesn't really benefit um, the children, let's say, born in Africa or other parts of the world at this stage. So the whole concept of the charity was how do we collate all the learning that we have got in this country in our team and how do we disseminate and uh, thereby help the kids um, and the families in other parts of the world? That was the focus of the charity. We set it up. Tell me a little bit about how people um, find out more about the charity, if you would, please, Doctor. Uh, so it's Gemini Untwined. Um, we have a website and uh, please do visit the website. It tells you about the work we do and how we are at the moment trying to help other families that are in this position. So we're actively helping other families in this situation as, as we speak. And Doctor, what about going back to these two little girls? They have now been separated. I'm guessing it was a massive team to, to deal with that operation and then the aftercare. How are they doing now? Uh, the girls are doing well. The girls are doing well. We're six days after the surgery. We're delighted to see they're doing so well at this stage. It's still early days, though. You know, one does need to wait a few weeks at least to make sure there are no infections or any other complications. But, you know, there's every reason to be optimistic um, uh, at the moment. And they can go on to have a normal life? Indeed. Indeed. That's our expectation, our hope. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, congratulations, Doctor, and uh, hopefully people will go along to the website and um, check out how they can support other youngsters around the world with a similar condition. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Have a look uh, at these uh, images. We've got some crackers for you today. Anyone with a fear of heights or falling should look away right now, including me, Alain Robert, known as the French Spider-Man, has been climbing another tower on the outskirts of Paris while usually doing solo climbs. This time, he was accompanied by three other young climbers. He's 60. He was arrested more than an hour into his equipment-free climb for endangering lives of others and placed into police custody. So climbing up the side of that building and had absolutely no equipment to keep him on the side of the building. Are you mad? Uh, we'll have uh, more on that in the next hour here on Sky News. Uh, more also on uh, what Sajid Javid, the health secretary, has said to me this morning. He's been talking primarily about uh, the fact that taxes, national insurance tax, will go up by one and a quarter percent. He was justifying that despite being uh, a Conservative uh, cabinet minister. He was saying that it was the Conservative thing to do. That was a very fascinating chat and uh, he hopes that the money will be used to reduce the uh, waiting list. But he also... Very interestingly, he talked about jabs for 12 to 15 year olds. You know, it's an incredibly hot topic at the moment. And he is the most senior health minister that I've certainly heard from. I don't know what you think. And he was saying 12 year olds can, um, ha depending on what uh, the uh, chief medical officer says, but in his opinion, 12 year olds should be able to speak to their parents. And then if their parents say, we don't want you to have this vaccine and the 12 year old does, then the 12-year-old can overrule their parents and have a vaccine for COVID-19. 
19. So I suppose if you take that to the logical conclusion, these 12-year-olds could have parents that are anti-vaxxers, for example. They're saying, under no circumstances are you having that. And the 12-year-old goes back to school and says, you know, I still want to have it. What do you think about that? That's a fascinating talking point, isn't it, here on Sky News this morning? You can tweet me directly if you would like to, at Kay Burley, talking about that. And also the first firefighter on the scene of 9-11 in just a moment.